Hello, outdoors enthusiasts. This is Tommy's Outdoors podcast, episode 31. Our guest today is Aideen McGee, director with WRI, and WRI stands for Wildlife Rehabilitation Ireland. So that's an organization that uh, takes uh, all the injured animals, uh, birds with broken wings, etc., um, and they try to rehabilitate them, uh, return them back to full health, and then return them to the wild. Um, so very, uh, I think, uh, benevolent organization that does excellent job in uh, supporting wildlife. And so before we jump into the podcast itself, um, there's always a first. And uh, so far, I've been fortunate enough to be able to find uh, good places to record a podcast. I think only one of the first episodes was recorded in the car. Uh, but it was just a very short episode. Well, this time we were recording in a hotel lobby. Um, there's a long story behind that, uh, how it happened, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to spare you that, that story. So you hear, so we will hear a lot of uh, background noise. Um, there was some corporate type of meeting or training uh, happening, and uh, we were recording in the lobby, and uh, apparently that group had a break, and they just kind of spilled out of the meeting room, and you see the chat, you hear, you will hear their chatter in the background. Um, nevertheless, I, I think that uh, uh, recording is okay, and you will be able to hear no problem what we're saying. Um, so uh, just, just a heads up. Um, and yeah, I think uh, right now it's nothing left uh, to say, but just go to the podcast itself. So ladies and gentlemen, Aideen McGee. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, with me today, Aideen McGee. How are you? Hi, Tommy. I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Very good. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, uh, you are member of the very important for the wildlife organization. Yeah, well, I um, work with two different wildlife organizations, Tommy. Um, one is Wildlife Rehabilitation Ireland. Um, so I'm a director with um, WRI for the last couple of years. Um, so a lot of my work is, is based um, with WRI, but I'm also a wildlife rehabilitator with the Kildare Animal Foundation Wildlife Unit. All right. So yeah. these are like two organizations that are doing essentially the same thing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, um, WRI, um, we are uh, we kind of oversee wildlife rescue and um, lots of different organizations in Ireland. So we offer help and support where we can to different rehabilitators working around the country. Um, the Kildare Animal Foundation Wildlife Unit, we are an actual rehab centre based in County Kildare, so we do hands-on rescue and hands-on okay. rehabilitation. And so what's a, what's a connection between the two organizations? Is, uh, is, is, is it any connection? Uh, well, there isn't, there isn't. As WRI, we support um, all rehabilitators right away throughout the country. But my initial involvement was actually with KAF and mm -hmm. with the Wildlife Unit. And it was through KAF and the Wildlife Unit that I actually did a course with WRI a couple of years ago. And my involvement grew from there. So Okay, so uh, WRI... Yeah supports KAF. Yes, absolutely. And as okay. WRI, we support lots of different organizations who are doing wildlife rescue throughout the, the entire island, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. And so the idea is to help animals that are injured and, yes. and, and require... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Any any wildlife casualty, everything from your humble little pigeon, you know, and mm -hmm. we get lots of our calls are about pigeons, I have to say. So oh. particularly, I'm based in Dublin, even though I'm with the KAF Wildlife mm -hmm. Unit. Um, so an awful lot of our calls are about pigeons and hedgehogs and uh, crows, everything from that right up to foxes and badgers and deer and everything you can possibly think of really um, wildlife rescue is very seasonal so depending from one time of the year to the other say from you know mid-march until september we have what's called orphan season so that's where we're getting just baby animal after baby animal in um, and wow. then this time of the year a lot of incidents are more weather related so if we happen to have something like a, a you know severe weather incident we'll have a certain number of casualties coming in from that particular incident. And I, I already know, from, because we, we had a, like a exchange messages on Twitter. Yes. I already know that you will go into egg, you know, very, a lot of detail about that, which I'm just looking forward to. Oh, so, so, so I'm looking forward to <laughs> so as, much. As much detail as you want, Tommy. <laughs> yeah, very good. So all the detail. Yeah. So um, before before we're going to proceed, uh, for our listeners, uh, if you hear in the background noise, it's because we're recording in the lobby in the hotel. Uh, so there's a lot of people over here and they're they're uh, working on some materials. So, uh, um, you know, I've tried to edit it as much as I can, but probably it's going to be a little bit of background, but that's okay. 
Um, and then before we go into that, Dika, how did how you start uh, doing what you're doing? How does this like... Uh, pure passion, Tommy, to be honest. Um, it's not what I what I do for a, for a living. I, I do have a regular night, Monday to Friday job as well. Um, but I suppose I've always been interested in, in animals and wildlife from mm. the time. I literally was a very small child. And I think I rescued my first blackbird when I was nine. Um, I was gonna <laughs> I was going to say that, that for sure you've yeah, really been re- yeah. rescuing the animals when you were small. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, and it just kind of grew from there. But you know, I never really found an opportunity to get involved in, in wildlife rescue or animal rescue um, until I was in my 20s I suppose so mm-hmm. um, at that stage then I started actually fostering domestic animals and hand rearing kittens and hand rearing puppies etc um, for various charities and then uh, through that got involved with the Kildare Animal Foundation looking after the domestic animals and companion animals and then about seven years ago we noticed a need for wildlife rescue people were turning up at our gates literally with a hedgehog in a, hedgehog in a box or you know an, an injured blackbird um, and saying can you guys do something about it. Mm. So Dan Donaher is our manager and Dan set up the wildlife unit and the wildlife unit has just grown and grown ever since. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's fascinating. Um, so so you know I don't even I don't even want to know where to start because there are so many so many things like like um, this is NGO, right? This is this is like a non-governmental organization. Uh, well, we're yeah, we're we're not actually technically, and well, I suppose we are an NGO actually, uh, on a very small scale. Okay, mm-hmm. so uh, but yeah, we're completely voluntary. So we're um, all of our work, all of our people who are working with us are all volunt- volunteers. So we're all doing it out of a sense of passion and a sense of just really, really wanting to help wherever we can. And every tiny drop really does help. It doesn't matter how little or how much people can do. Um, so we're relying entirely on voluntary donations to fund our work mm-hmm. and the goodwill of the people that we work with. So we have a lot of vets and a lot of veterinary nurses who are on board with us now as well, and they help out where they can. So right. Yeah. Right. Right. So, mm. so uh, how how is how the recruitment process work? Because like I pre- presume when when you were starting, mm. there was like nothing. No. Right? So so have you had to like reach out to the to the nurses and yeah. the veterinarians and say, hey, we're doing this organization. Would like to get involved. And yes, absolutely. Um, social media has been our savior. Um, so mm. we have quite a our. Facebook page is Kildare Animal Foundation Wildlife Unit mm-hmm. and I think we have about 10,000 followers on that now We've actually it's slightly more possibly I haven't looked at the figures mm-hmm. lately um, but most of our most of our supporters I think see us on, online and see us on social media and again if you Google Wildlife Rescue our Wildlife yeah. Helpline is one of the first ones that comes up so um, you know we, we help where we can and, and do what we can and a lot of it's just word of mouth so um, you know Dan and myself and some of the other rehabilitators on a regular enough basis you get a phone call from a random number and it's mm-hmm. somebody saying oh listen you know you, you rescued a, a duck from a friend of mine last year and they gave me your number so the word just spreads and you know members of the public want to help where they can and people want to do as much as they can to help mm. out um, so word spread so social media we've you know we've been lucky enough as well that we've been um, we've had quite a lot of exposure generally through the media um, and like I said just I think it's people are finding more and more animals they were always there there just wasn't an outlet to actually do anything about it before yeah. um, so now people have a contact and they we do what we can when we can yeah and and you're and you're right because i remember you know even you know when i was small it was it was like you said sometimes an issue like oh there's a there's a bird somewhere there's yeah. a you know animal injured or something and now what you're going to do with that and yes. and you and usually yeah. the first instinting is go to the veterinary ve- veterinary yes. specialist but they're you know these are businesses they're sometimes closed uh yeah. in the weekends there's yeah. like nothing nothing to do no and you know i think the vets are absolutely fantastic and we couldn't manage without them but what Wildlife Rescue really is a team effort. So, um, you know, the vets that work with us and the veterinary nurses that work with us, they will go, they will do their um, their intervention and their intervention is providing the immediate medical care that an animal needs. But an animal often would need extended period of rehabilitation. So, you know, we might have a hedgehog that comes into us with, a, a say, a strimmer injury. It would be very typical of what a hedgehog will present with. Mm-hmm. Um, so somebody has been mowing long grass, doesn't realise there's a hedgehog in it, and the hedgehog will come in with something like a severe laceration on its, um, on its head for example right. um, so we need the vets to suture that you know to flush it out to clean it to get it to a point where it's okay then to come back to rehabilitation we don't expect a vet to hang on to that animal for the period of rehabilitation which could right. be anything between four and six weeks so that's where we come in and we provide that rehabilitation and that daily care until that animal is ready to return so to that's, a, that's 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 actually a very good point which i never thought about it because you have like this initial intervention yes where you you know putting bones together or like you know uh, yeah. you know taking like initial care yeah. of the animal but that's not not over yeah. you cannot just that now 
off you go. You need, you need to go through the process of actually yes, rehabilitation. Yes, absolutely. And how does this look like? Is it like, you know, for the for the benefits of our listeners and mine as well? Is it yeah. looks like your those animals become like a temporary like a pets? No, absolutely not. Um, you know, we're as hands off as we possibly can be. These are wild animals. They belong in the wild. They are absolutely not our pets at any at any stage. Tempting <laughs> as it is to, <laughs> to think of them like that. And you know, when you're looking at looking after an animal on an ongoing basis for you know four weeks or six weeks or two months or whatever it mm-hmm. is, you know, you automatically do become attached to them. But you you remain a, a detached distance as well, if that makes sense. I know it's a bit of a contradiction, but you really do care for them for the time you have them. But you always have your mind these animals do not belong to us you know they do need to go back to their natural Mm -hmm. habitat and that's our ultimate aim so we handle them as minimally as we possibly can so um, if it is something like a strimmer injury say for a hedgehog for example Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time that animal just needs to be monitored and have its medication put into its food every day and weighed every two or three days to make sure he's maintaining weight or gaining weight if necessary Um, but other than that they are left completely and utterly alone apart from necessary medical intervention but isn't like like a lot intervention anyway if you're weighing that, that how often you're weighing like in that like, exam? if we're weighing them probably only every couple of days it depends on the state the animal is in if they're in you know a state of severe emaciation we might weigh them every 24 hours once they actually start to recover and gain a little bit of weight well then you know you're you're keeping an eye on them to make sure they're okay mm-hmm. so you do it as necessary and it really does depend from case to case but we absolutely yes we, we don't want those animals to become habituated to us because when they go back to the wild we want them to have their natural instinctual fear mm-hmm. of people because the vast majority of people are wildlife friendly, but of course, mm-hmm. you know, not everybody yeah, it's is. It's safer. So it's safer if they're a kind of like yeah, if they have <laughs> not a, drawn into no, humans. absolutely. If they have just a, you know a natural caution, that's what we want to maintain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because even even with the with the best intent, somebody might actually turn them into pets, and yes. this is probably not what we absolutely. want. Absolutely. Anyway. You know, every year we get um, fox cubs in. Okay, so when mm-hmm. fox cubs come into us, usually around beginning of March, kind of mid March is when mm-hmm. foxes give birth. Um, so when fox cubs come into us, this year I had. Um, I think I had four cubs that I had at various points. One little guy came in to me when he was only about six days old, so his eyes were closed, his ears were closed. Wow. Um, looked essentially like a puppy at that stage, absolutely tiny. Um, but again, as soon as I had him at home then for, I think I had him at home for about six, first six weeks of his life. Then he went back down to the wildlife unit where we had a number of other fox cubs that were completely wild. And it was just extraordinary to see it, Tommy, because mm-hmm. as soon as I brought him back down, he had been he had been like a pet for the first six weeks. At that yeah. stage, he needed nurturing. He needed care. He slept with a teddy bear. He slept with a little hot water bottle. You know, I was oh. syringe feeding him initially. That mm-hmm. went on to bottle feeding. And mm-hmm. then we started to wean him. But as soon as he hit a point where he was actually able to eat independently and um, was just a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger, he went back down to the unit. Um, it was very hard for me to let him go because I'd, I'd been his mammy yeah. for six weeks, essentially. You know? yeah. And uh, But, you know, we're, we're well used to doing this and that is the hard part of wildlife rescue. So brought him back down to where he had a, a number of other fox cubs. And as soon as I put him into the pen, I just stayed with him for maybe the first 20 minutes or so. And within that 20 minute period, he literally gained a tiny little bit of caution around me. It was just amazing. And I was like, my job is done here. Now I can pull back. And from that point forward, he just got wilder and wilder and wilder. Um, And, you know, less handling. And again, just to a point where we're feeding him and cleaning him once a day with the other fox cubs um, and within I'd say probably a week or two weeks it, it was as if he had never been handled at all um, and that's exactly what we wanted mm-hmm. him you know, we wanted him to run and hide when he saw us coming eventually he went and the other fox cubs went to an outdoor pen that was at the back of the shelter so they had almost no human contact at all apart from daily monitoring right. once a day and they were all released successfully in September this year right right so, so, but they are like in the pens or in the cages like they're, they're they, like what how does it look like so do they have like a how much space do they have? Okay, it, it, re- re- it depends re- on what stage they're at. So I said when he was with me at home, I live in a three-bedroom terrace house and mm-hmm. my, my smallest room is my wildlife unit. So it's like mm-hmm. a mini version of a rehab unit. <laughs> it's amazing what you Lovely. can fit in there. Okay, so, um, <laughs> I can imagine the coming in the boxes stocking up the ceilings with yes, different much, animals. Yeah, and like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, and uh, so start with me initially down to the shelter where they're in a, a pen that's probably about maybe... Um, I'm not sure the exact dimensions, maybe three meters by three meters. Mm -hmm. And that's an indoor pen. And then from there, they progress to what's called a pre-release pen, which would probably be about six meters by five meters. It's actually, it's pretty big. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, again, has an area for them to dig. It has old tree trunks. um, It has tunneling for them to go and hide in. And again, just creating as natural an environment as we can. And then we gradually start introducing more natural.
natural foods that they would have. Initially, they're on dog food and cat food. Mainly cat food is more nutritionally complete mm-hmm. for them. Um, and then we start introducing um, yes, a, a more natural range of meat, etc., to them as well mm-hmm. that they, they learn to forage for. And um, yeah, we've had great success with them going back to the wild. Thankfully. How do you know that the cat food is more nutritionally suitable for, for um, foxes? A veterinary advice. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you know what? Here's so, so, oh my God, I have so many questions. Like, so first of all, when you describe your your room and you know all these animals, like mm. my thought is like, somebody will listen to that podcast and it's like, oh my god, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be okay. rescuing animals. And yeah. next thing you know, they're gonna buy like a number of cages and pens yeah. and so on, stuck them at the ceiling and stuff the yeah. animals there. That's probably not good idea. No, we would we would absolutely plead with people definitely not to do that this is something that I have done over the last seven years um, I said I've, I've, I've done a wildlife rehabilitation course um, I'm now actually helping to um, kind of co-tutor those wildlife courses as well with WRI because this is something that is my entire life outside of work so I have built up experience and knowledge over the last seven years nobody has a monopoly on knowledge in wildlife rescue so we are all learning every single day but we're doing it alongside other rehabilitators and um, vets veterinary nurses you know, people who are working in this field all the time. We work with mm-hmm. National Parks and Wildlife Service as well. So, um, and you know, I every day I'll come up against a question and you know some situation that I haven't dealt with before. So, no matter how much experience you have, you're still learning. So, if anyone's interested in doing wildlife rehabilitation, I absolutely would ask them to please contact WRI. Check out our websites. We have a number of different websites. And there are tons of information there about how you can get involved in wildlife rescue, about people who are already doing wildlife rescue. So, you know, find your local rehabilitator, make contact with them, tell them you're interested in helping and interested in getting involved, but do it with their support and their advice because it's really, really easy to do harm even though you intend on doing good. Yeah, so no, not on your own. Not on no, your absolutely like, not on your own. Really no, no, it's very <laughs> much a team effort and, you know, you need the support of a veterinary professional um, mm. in the work that you're doing. So, yeah. yeah. And is that the main sca- skill set, like a ve- like being veterinary professional? Is that the uh, main skill set or is it like any, something, or is it like just only like a 50%? There's like 70%? Of no, uh, uh, in terms of the, the, I say vets probably are less than 10% of, of oh, wow. you know, absolutely. Um, because the, their intervention is relatively brief, you know. So is, that initial, in. is that the initial yeah, intervention? Exactly. And, and then, then that's when you hand back over to your rehabilitator and help th- let, let them do the rest of it as well. But mm-hmm. we'll always have our vets on the, the end of the line ready to help us and give us advice where necessary. Yeah. Mm. And so, so now going back to these foxes, you, you said they, su- they were successfully released into nature. But they ob- obviously they missed like a, um, this interaction with the adult fox. Yes. Yeah, so so, so how, d- how, do you, how do you kind of, um, you know, making up for for lack of that uh, um, interaction it, it, it just natural instinct seems to really kick in with them and we have done monitoring programs oh, so really? we do know to the actually so they do yeah. not learn like there is not a process like, like learning from no they from absolutely do as well and we're just careful where we release them to that they're not going to be in competition with an awful lot of adult foxes and they hopefully will be accepted into a social grouping they tend to be relatively solitary apart from their family members mm-hmm. um, but yeah instinct just seems to kick in and like I said we do um, when we're feeding them we do start scatter feeding them we, we hide food we make them and, and foxes ah. they do hunt but they're also scavengers you know so mm-hmm. they will drop a tuna they will eat whatever they can yeah. and they also dig for slugs and things too so and they mm-hmm. will eat berries and they'll eat wild fruit um, so foxes are they're resilient animals so they really do thrive well um, we also are very very careful that we don't release them say back into an urban environment because we would be concerned about them being in an urban environment uh, okay. um, so we, we have one or two or well probably more actually release sites that we choose very very carefully and we do a thing called a soil soft release for them as well so when they go mm. back out to the wild initially they they're not just fired out basically okay mm-hmm. so to go down to an area where they will have a pen um, and that pen will be put into the area where we're hoping they will actually um, you know d- develop a territory um, and they're left in that pen for maybe a day or two and then the pen is left open for them but food is left into the pen every single day so they're free to go but they can come back for their food supply and we'll keep uh-huh. doing that as long as they keep returning until such a time as they literally have just disappeared one day off that one day and then we'll know that they're yeah they're feeding independently and they no longer need our intervention so that's called a soft release that's what we do for orphans but if we have say if an adult fox that comes into us so say for example we had a an adult fox there in 
I think it was March. I was in bed one night at about half eleven, mm. and the phone rang. Right, and someone said to me, oh, "You know, I've just seen a fox being hit by a car." So I was in my pajamas, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Oh my god!" You know, <laughs> will I go? Will I put out an appeal? And I just said, "You know, it's handy just to get out of bed and go myself." So hopped out of bed, um, went out, and there was a place called Strawberry Beds out in Lucan, out in in, in Dublin. And um, the fox had, by the time I got there, very kindly, the guy who had come across the accident, the person who had hit the fox, had driven off, and this person was driving up behind him, and stayed with the fox until I got there and literally just when I got out of the car the fox had managed to crawl into bushes so we had quite a job trying to get him back out but mm. we got him out anyway turns to out to find him and then and yeah yeah because he was, it was just quite a, a thicket he was in so we could just see his tail sticking out so mm. um, managed to get him out anyway and got into our vet and um, you don't want to damage the animal further no, because no, you no. don't know whether it's a like a oh, the spine is injured or whatever so absolutely. you kind of don't want to grab it by the tail and pull oh, it out no, of no, it precisely and the mechanism of injury being hit by a car you know head traumas and spinal injuries and pelvic injuries will be probably the most common type of injury as a result of that type of a situation so um, he turned out to have a, a head trauma but not a particularly bad head trauma mm-hmm. so he was with us for about a month I think and it was amazing to see him gradually getting back just to a full state of just absolutely vibrant health um, but mm. we were able to do a hard release with him and a hard release means that we brought him right back to the exact location we found him in um, which was just along by the banks of Liffey um, in Strawberry Bed so a really beautiful location and we were literally just able to let him out with exactly where we found him and never to be seen again which was mm. perfect you know so again we had done our job and just he was ready to go back he was an adult fox he had his established territory so it was no issue letting him out there again so yeah. um, we didn't need to do a soft release with him yeah is that hard to see all those injured animals because you obviously you know you, yeah. you love all the animals yeah. you care about them right yeah yet you're kind of dealing on an almost daily basis with animals that are injured is it, that i yeah. presume it's yeah it's is hard there, is, is yeah. there hard like emotionally um it is and you'll always have certain cases that really stick with you as well that you know affect you more than others and um you do you do res- develop a resilience as well i think you have to develop a resilience if you didn't do that you wouldn't be able to do the rescue you know so and mm. the reality of wildlife rescue is and these statistics are consistent across ireland and the uk that approximately 50 percent of of wildlife casualties don't survive you know because 50%. about 50 percent yeah in some cases some people would argue it's higher our experience Would does it vary by the percent. by the species? Um, it does vary by species, absolutely. So we're looking at kind of rounded numbers right mm-hmm. across across everything, really. Um, and the reason for that is that you know, if you look at your your companion animals, so your dog or your cat, you have at home the second something is wrong with that animal if they're off their food or they have a slight injury you pick up on it and you'll bring them to the vet straight mm-hmm. away wild animals instinct is to just hide if they've anything if they're anyway unwell if they're weakened if they're not able to compete um, along mm-hmm. with their their counterparts they will hide themselves away so usually by the time an animal is ill enough mm-hmm. uh, to be discovered it's at a stage of really really advanced um, either illness or injury so that you're automatically on the back footing with them um, they're much more prone to stress so we have to be very very careful how you manage those animals so you know say by my little tiny wildlife room at home i have to be really careful that i don't have animals that are going to you know cause each other stress as well so if mm-hmm. i have something like a bird of prey um and i have a blackbird i have to make sure that visually they can't see one another as well <laughs> you know because the blackbird obviously yes. would be fairly traumatized by having a bird of prey staring right at me you know right. so um there's a moment you don't stick them into two, two like a pens next to each no, other no, in, the absolutely, <laughs> in your room <laughs> exactly so um and we, we're the same in the unit as well you know so something like a bird of prey that comes in they're again really prone to stress so things like sparrow hawks in particular um mm-hmm. can die from stress just very very quickly buzzards tend to be a little bit more resilient as do peregrine falcons and you know so it depends from from bird to bird but any bird that is really prone to stress we'll automatically make sure we have the front of their Their, um, their pen carried covered down entirely to keep them in the dark as much as possible and to minimize mm-hmm. any kind of visual um, visual stimulation that might stress them out um, so there are things we can do to minimize stress but regardless it's still a highly stressful environment for a wild animal to be in yeah um, so yeah a- about 50 percent by 50 percent don't make it 50% do make it and that's what we concentrate on mm-hmm. you know so yes it's hard and yes it's something that you never really become habituated to and I think the day that I stop caring that's the day you shouldn't be doing wildlife rescue you know yeah. you need to, to keep that trying to strike that balance of caring but still being realistic about what you're doing as well yeah yeah and what are the animals that are most likely to to uh, go successfully through rehabilitation and be released um, most success rate I think it, it depends actually even from time of year to time of year as well oh. and um, so we've a great success with swans actually so and we tend to get an awful lot of swans into the unit um, we actually had one that was on the front page of the Irish Times today coincidentally mm-hmm. um, oh. one of our volunteers Alex uh, released a swan that had been picked up in Wexford a couple of a couple of well it must be about, about four or five weeks ago now I would say actually mm-hmm. um, 
And that swan was released back successfully today in Bray and her entire she'd lost her entire family through um, predation and through uh, road traffic accidents so now mm-hmm. she's been introduced into a new group of swans um, but just happened to somebody picked up the, the story anyway so it appeared yeah. in the papers today um, so we've great success with swans we have good success with foxes um, badgers we don't have as many of them in but we have great success um, in the bird world pigeons are incredibly resilient <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. Um, and we place no value judgments on life so we mm-hmm. don't care if something is a you know a pigeon and there are millions of them out there or something really rare where rare like a peregrine falcon mm-hmm. everything is treated the same you know so right. it's not our place to and what are the animals that are least resilient or like there is a very little success um gosh that's a good question um i think some of the i mentioned the sparrow hawk there yes. so some of the birds of prey that are prone to really really high levels of stress right um will be ones that we'd be really really cautious about you know so um adult songbirds tend to be really stressed out as well so they can oh. be quite hard to treat and hard to handle um so things like adult blackbirds often um when they come in as, as chicks they're absolutely fine mm-hmm. um and we hand rear loads of baby blackbirds every year and again it's amazing to see that as soon as you stop hand feeding them and eating independently and um, they start getting very very stressed when you ha- tr- go near them at all to try and clean out their cages say so we try to get those out into an aviary and get them released as quickly as we possibly can yeah. so yeah and and is it uh, often that you see the animal and you said like well no it's it's beyond the rescue yes absolutely that'd be qu- uh, quite and what's common ha- and what's happening oh quite common yeah be common and what's, what's happening then uh, we will euthanize where we have to euthanize you know our our mm-hmm. two main aims are to our, well, our number one aim is to return an animal to the wild to get it back to a full state of health and an animal cannot be released back to the wild unless it has absolutely 100% health and is able to survive um, alongside its peers in the wild um, oh. our other um, aim is to minimize suffering and sometimes that is all you can do so say for example if we get a bird in um, a gull we get tons of herring gulls in every year mm. um, we hand rear a lot of them and we release loads of them successfully but you know gulls being quite prevalent in the city now a lot of the time we get them in from collision injuries so they may have something like a broken wing and if they have a broken wing on a bird it depends where the, the break is if mm-hmm. the break is along the length of a bone well then you'll have a very good chance of it recovering but if it's a, a shoulder break or a break near a joint um as the as the, the break starts to heal they get what's called a callus formation around yes. that part of the bone they can't stretch their wing out fully and that bird will never fly again so oh. that bird is not releasable so gulls can live up to 30 years so we absolutely on principle wow. yeah it's incredible and amazing yeah, lives. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. so we would never uh, that bird would have to be euthanized in that case unfortunately because we absolutely would not confine a bird that belongs in the skies we absolutely would not confine it to the ground for the remainder of for the remainder of its life okay so, yeah. so you're so there's no also not an option like hey I have this bird here. It, it's not, you know, we can't return to the wild, but you know, it'll just do, do just okay as a pet, and maybe not the bird, but like in a, in any other animal. No, is that an option as well, or is it like no, no, it has um, to go back to the wild? No, the the again, the principles of wildlife rescue are that this animal is this releasable. Is wildlife. Yeah, it's wildlife. It is a wild creature. It belongs in the wild, and our job is to do our absolute best to get him back out into the wild where they belong. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned hundred percent. So I I'll, I'll ask you like. And again, my uh, my experience comes from like domestic dogs, yes. right? So, for example, yeah. domestic dog do quite well, yeah. in my view, without the without the leg, yes, for example, okay. right? Yeah. So, would you release to the wild a fox, three-legged uh, fox? It's no, not hundred percent. It's not a hundred percent, and. Uh, we wouldn't release a, a three-legged fox back to the wild because essentially what you're more than likely doing is condemning them to, them to a slow death. Okay, so, um, you know, again, your domestic dog, you're getting up every morning to feed your dog and to look after right, your dog. Right. Anything goes wrong with your dog, you're going to get him straight down to the vet and make sure he's treated. That fox is trying to compete, you know, in a very in a very competitive world out there for, for foxes and for badgers and for every other animal out mm-hmm. there. Um, and you're asking that animal to compete on a, you know, a, a, mm-hmm. a far less able animal to compete against animals that are fully fully able-bodied um, and able to look after themselves they, they will be at a distinct disadvantage we can't monitor them we can't make sure they're okay so therefore um, and uh, you know from again we've got advice from vets in the UK say these animals don't do well and they don't survive so um, therefore we can release them looking like they're perfectly fine and they will be perfectly fine from the rehabilitation process but as soon as they get out into the wild they won't do well 
Right, right, right. Um, hedgehogs were the one exception that we used to make where if a hedgehog had a, a rear leg amputated uh, or hind leg amputated, we'd say, that's fine, they can survive, they'd be grand. Hedgehogs use their, their front limbs for digging and to look, you know, to dig mm-hmm. for slugs, etc. Um, but now we realise as well, actually, that that isn't really feasible unless you're releasing them into a very large monitored wildlife area, say. Um, but then you're looking at really confining their habitat because hedgehogs can travel up to about five kilometers every single night not wow. usually in a linear pattern they usually go in a zigzag pattern um but hedgehogs that have one rear leg missing hedgehogs use their back legs to groom around their heads and around their ears and mm. it's been discovered now that a lot of hedgehogs that have a rear leg amputated um they'll often be found with a really heavy parasite burden on that side basically so if they were say a right hind leg right um, because they, can, can they can't they can straight away ticks and things yeah so they come in and they might be absolutely covered in ticks on one side of their head and that's really debilitating for them and cause them to become very ill um and that wasn't something that was realized in right wildlife rescue for a long time so we do realize it now when we are all learning so unfortunately if a hedgehog comes in and a hedgehog near needs a hind leg amputated that animal will we don't want to do it but mm-hmm. on a welfare basis we have no option but to euthanize that animal okay yeah. and and if someone listen to that podcast now and says like well i'll go and and you know get a three-legged hedgehog and let it live in my uh, garden or something like that is that is that an option or is it like absolutely well, you you don't want to do that well look you know different people have different opinions on this um you know if somebody has a very very large garden that is completely secure and completely enclosed um and it has a suitable habitat for a hedgehog and they're willing to supplement feed that hedgehog every day and to monitor it for you know flea infestation and mm-hmm. for parasite burdens etc you know uh, there is an argument to say that that that, that mm-hmm. hedgehog could live a very a very good life you know and hedgehogs can live up to 10 years mm-hmm. um so again from our point of view in wildlife rescue we would say we want to get that animal back out of the wild i'm sure there are loads of people who'd argue and you can absolutely see their point of view as well that mm-hmm. if that hedgehog is well looked after is essentially living a free life but a monitored free life well that's something for everyone to decide for themselves whether they think it's acceptable one thing I would say if you are going to have hedgehogs if you'd like to have hedgehogs coming into your garden make your garden wildlife friendly and you will have hedgehogs coming in anyway and hedgehogs actually are great climbers a lot of people don't realise that so mm. they can climb a hedgehog can climb a wall that's five or six feet high as long as there's something like ivy on it for them to cling on to so they'll yeah. scramble up the ivy they get to the top of the wall roll into a ball and just roll down the other side wow. so, yeah so they only spend energy going up and then just enjoy the ride back down basically yeah. Yeah. how did I, how did you learn so much about hedgehogs um, I'm not like I'm assuming that you that you that you know a lot about various different animals but I'm just being blown away about your knowledge about the hedgehogs and oh. about you know how they scratch themselves and they need all four legs yeah, and all that a little bit by little bit um these lots of these are from cases that we've actually had so these are pure experience you know and mm. um again like I said working with we're very lucky in WRI that we've had lots of really really good international speakers coming to our conferences and helping facilitate our courses and uh, so we're all learning together all the time and um okay. you know my I'm have my wildlife manuals at home from the uh, the BSAVA the British um Veterinary Association Um, so I read these avidly as well. Okay, so right. kind of hand in hand with having my hedgehogs in the in the wildlife unit in KAF. Um, it, it literally is. It's as long as you take a wild approach in wildlife rescue, you build your knowledge as you go. Really. Yeah. You know, so, is it possible to kind of make a living out of rescuing wildlife? Not really, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so I wish it was. I'd be doing it full time if I could, Tommy. Um, yeah, you, know, you should. I think you uh, should. I'd love to do it full time. Yeah, but I have to. Yeah, have to pay bills still as well, unfortunately. So um, it's it's very come very on, difficult. people, go ahead, go ahead and donate, <laughs> donate like. <laughs> Absolutely. As long as I can eat, I'm happy. Okay. Now so we're gonna p- we're gonna put we're animals. gonna p- we're gonna put the links on the, on the <laughs> description of the podcast, and we're gonna just do the campaign. Like oh, people, go and donate excellent, because excellent, thank you. <laughs> absolutely. Um, no, uh, you know it's very difficult because even say veterinary professionals. I mean, you know, there is no money in wildlife rescue essentially. So vets are going to still, even if they had an absolute passion for wildlife, they have to make a living. So they're treating their domestic animals or their farm animals or large animals, whatever it happens to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the minute in Ireland, it's nearly impossible to make a living out. Of It is impossible to make a living out of wildlife rescue, really. I um, think the UK, probably something similar, but um, except most people, I, I'm hoping that's something that will actually change. And actually, as part mm-hmm. of WRI, um, one of the things that we have a, a project underway at the minute, which is really exciting for us, um, is a project to build Ireland's first dedicated wildlife um, teaching and rehabilitation hospital. So it'll be based out in North County, Dublin. Um, we do have a location that we can't really kind of talk about just yet, mm-hmm. um, but we have the support of Fingal County Council, which is just amazing. 
Um, so it's a, a kind of a three to five year plan, but we're hoping that within within three years, a feasibility study has been done already. So we mm-hmm. know our location is a suitable one um, and we will be building the hospital. It is a reality, which is just amazing for us. Wow. Now, it'll be mainly staffed by volunteers as well, you know, yeah. and um, but... Yeah, but you know, there's a lot of organization who are based on the volunteers, but there's like a core staff. Yes. Who's doing that full time. Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, You know, I'd say for anyone interested in getting involved, involved in wildlife rehab, do it out of passion do it because you really really care and yeah. have no expectations of making a living out of it and yeah sure that's fine. for sure that's that's for sure that's a that's a, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's, a that's a good recipe for for success yeah. right do something with passion and like yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah. um that's, that's, that's fascinating um you know i'm, I'm always going to ask you like do, can you share a little bit more of a, of your of your in depth knowledge about like for example foxes and or some other animals like oh i know there's a que- there's a, there's a good question okay. like what about goats like a feral goat, are you treating feral goats as a wildlife? Or like oh wow, <laughs> we've actually never had a feral goat in the in the unit. Okay, so um, okay. we've had. A re- but hypothetically speaking, hypothetically speaking, if say I know there are a lot of feral goats living up around Glendalough, so um, in County Wicklow, and we've had a couple of deer coming in from down around there. Actually, wow. so you know, if we had a call about a about a, a goat, we absolutely would treat it if it was a feral goat. Um, it's just never actually happened. Okay, right. so yeah, there you go. I I can't really answer that one <laughs> simply because I don't have the experience of it. So yeah, um, well, but it was, yeah. it was it was more a question around like like you know what you consider wild. wildlife what yeah. you consider because like yeah. someone may argue like a pigeon like are you seriously is it the wildlife like mm, it probably is well, yeah we get yeah no and actually you know we'd often get racing pigeons in as well which clearly aren't actually you know they are domesticated yeah um but pigeons originate in the wild pigeons are we would can still consider them a, a wild casualty if they come into us even if they are a racing pigeon um and racing pigeons often we just find them completely exhausted somebody will ring us and say look a pigeon has landed on my balcony has been there for the last two days and it wow. turns out it's just a pigeon that's you know gone off course or whatever it happens to be literally just needs a few days of food and water and then they go off again as well so absolutely right. we will treat them yeah you know 100%, okay yeah. okay so uh, now you mentioned deer so yeah. let's let's go ho- into into whole yeah. other area because i presume sure. this is like a huge huge subject with the deer so first of all during our conversation again earlier on you yeah. mentioned like deer are not really that well maybe not suitable is not the right word but they're mm. not uh you cannot rehabilitate them well. Well, yeah, and we 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 get very few deer in actually. Okay, so mm. um, the deer that we have had in that we've had success with generally have been fawns, tiny fawns that have come into us. Um, and is it like usually they shouldn't come to you in the first place because yeah, uh, well, because because uh, like uh, uh, fawns are being left. That's ex- in, you know, I, and I even remember yes. like a, like a, when I was a small kid, which was yeah. like a lot of years ago, right? Yeah. It was like a campaign on the TV, like, hey, yeah. people, if yeah. you see small fawn, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. The mother yeah. will come back, you know, yeah. you will suckle and then we'll let the, yeah. it's, it's like, okay. And yeah. So this is happening. Like people say, oh, this poor deer, Absolutely. you know, mama should be around him. It's like, yeah. no, these are wildlife, wild animals. Yeah, no, 100%. And we'd often get calls from people as well saying, we have found this fawn, exactly like you're describing. Uh, we found this fawn has been abandoned and we're saying, most likely has not been abandoned just we'd ask people in that situation to monitor and go back maybe it can they can be on their own for up to kind of 10 to 12 hours basically so it absolutely mm-hmm. does look like the mother is gone but she's not the mother will leave the fawn in long grass you know and leave them there completely safely um and she'll go off and she'll feed etc and come back mm-hmm. to them eventually um well not completely safely because if foxes were the fine oh, them when i say completely safely i mean relatively okay yeah <laughs> you know like it for is the wildlife like for, for the wild wildlife animal. absolutely <laughs> as in they haven't been abandoned okay yeah, so you know yeah. um and that actually exactly the same thing happens with leverets with baby um, hair but we come back to them again mm, anyway sure. um, but the deer that come into us then deer suffer from a thing called post um, post capture myopathy which mm. basically is a, it's that was a term that you that you that you mentioned is like Did wow I end? <laughs> wow no so, I knew at that yeah. point I knew this is going to be a very interesting episode because oh. like okay we're no, going to go really actually, deep it, it's, <laughs> it's one of those terms I kind of like saying even to know. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> silly but anyway so uh, but it's post capture myopathy means it happen for up to three weeks after an animal is found and essentially kind of simply put the deer goes into shock and, the, and their body mm-hmm. shuts down and they die and it can happen really really suddenly 
family. So it looks like the animal is doing completely fine. You know, maybe they're suckling and they're gaining weight and then suddenly you go in one morning and they've just died. Okay, so, you know, we only take deer in when we absolutely have to when there is absolutely no other option because they are so so prone to this and to, to going into mm-hmm. shock and not doing well in, the, in, in captivity. Adult deer, the main concern with them is um, physically actually getting them into a situation where you can rehabilitate them. They again are highly, highly stressed animals. So if an and they're big. They're huge and they actually can be quite dangerous, you know. So yep. an animal that's obviously in a, in a distressed state, um, if you get a kick from a deer, you're in serious trouble, you know. Mm-hmm. So, And a lot of the time, their injuries are such as well that they can't be treated. So in which case, the only option we have, uh, we'll often get a call, say, from the guards or from the National Parks and Wildlife Service or from a member of the public, whoever mm-hmm. happens to find a deer. Um, and unfortunately, again, a lot of the time, the only option is to actually, um, we, we have a number of marksmen who will work with us who will go out um, and they will be able to bring that deer suffering to an end very quickly for us you right. know so and um, we would love to be in a position where it is they are treatable but a lot of the time they aren't and particularly you know a deer can keep moving when they are really badly injured so if a yes. deer is actually down the chances are their injuries are absolutely catastrophic and the chance of saving them are very slim anyway um mm. and most of the time the kind of situations we would get call abouts are um where an animal has been hit by a car so if an animal's been hit by a car you're looking at a little bit like the foxes you're looking at pelvic injuries broken mm-hmm. legs head traumas chance of recovering from any of that are really tiny you know so uh so like if it's a tiny fawn and the fawn definitely is injured or definitely has been abandoned then absolutely we'll take them in but it's a rare enough case to be honest yeah but yeah. 200 kilo red stag oh you wouldn't no you wouldn't. no it's not feasible you just can't do it we'd love to be able to do it but it's just not feasible and like i said you generally don't even get calls about them because these animals will keep moving like we, we've had calls from people up in ticknock woods and in, in north in south dublin sorry um, who've said, look, you know, they called us and said they've seen an animal running through the woods that clearly has been shot, um, mm-hmm. but not badly enough to take it down entirely. Right. Um, and that animal is obviously suffering, is obviously in a lot of pain. And by the time anyone gets out there, the animal is long gone. So they can keep stress and keep them moving, you know. Yes. So trying to actually even get close enough to them to help them is next. Not impossible to. Yes, that's that's yeah. that's, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. Oh, well. Um, listen, so someone may argue that... By doing what you're doing, by rescuing wild animals, we're actually interfering in the natural natural yeah. way the life of wildlife goes yeah. and yeah. these animals being, li- yeah. you know, there is a counter argument like uh, being hit by a car is not necessarily natural. I was just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> that's my answer, Tommy. Right? <laughs> okay, okay, so I already answered that for Yeah, you. you kind of answered yourself there. Okay, so, do you know, so many of the injuries that we see animals coming in with and even the illnesses we see animals coming in with, they're caused by people, you know, they're caused by um, human encroachment on their environment. So therefore, I think we really have an onus to actually actually help step in and help where we can and even if it's not caused by us Mm -hmm. if we have the power to minimize suffering for an animal i absolutely i can't see an argument why we wouldn't do that you know Mm -hmm. so um and we accept the fact that we can't help every animal that's absolutely fine you know so we'd love to be able to we know the natural order of things that some animals will be predated by other animals perfect that's exactly how it should be but if we can just help an animal that is actually suffering in front of us we will do that regardless of what the situation is yeah, yeah yeah and um so this type of organizations they're like around the world i presume right oh, this yeah is, there's this, lots this, of, this yeah. is like and and even like in, 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 in like in america i presume yeah. in asia and, and so on so this, is there any organization like a global or international organization that will kind of well i suppose the um world wildlife fund are they called that anymore actually <laughs> i'm not sure wwf yeah um yeah absolutely so there's, there's lots of, of huge international organizations that that are helping and um, wwf also kind of uh this i'm more asking about like a specifically rescuing oh, injured okay, animals right. rather than mm-hmm. um well there are a few very big organizations so say you know wildlife rehabilitation ireland we started our initial training as well with our american equivalents so they actually oh. yeah so our okay. courses actually would have come from them initially but now we've mm-hmm. developed our own courses um so they're a pretty big organization in the u.s obviously mm-hmm. what they did was adapted to suit our wildlife and mm-hmm. our habitats yes um but yeah so there, there are big organizations on various continents but there's no one global organization that i'm aware of certainly anyway yeah this is i think it's, quite, it's a relatively speaking quite a new area i think you know so really? yeah i think so from um you know the i think the first you know one of the first big realizations i suppose of the of wildlife and animals and appreciation of animals as being sentient beings was um you know go back to the 1960s and the story of born free and elsa mm-hmm. you know and mm-hmm. i know it's probably filmed mm-hmm. that yep. you know you know okay i wasn't around 
quite when it was made, but not too far after it, you know. And, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, oh, it's quite famous. I wasn't around when it was made as well. Yeah, uh, but, but, but people it's know like, the story, and there's yes. a, and, you know, a huge organization. I wonder if people know the story now, like like 15 oh. year olds. Probably not. Yeah, probably not. Go and look it up if you haven't heard it because mm. it's just extraordinary, you know. And exactly. some, it's, a, it's an amazing story, an amazing book, an amazing film. And the film is dated but still tells the story really well, mm-hmm. I think, you know. So, um, but I think that was the, 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 the start of the movement and this realisation that all life really is valuable, all life is equal. And, and I think that the principal thing for us is as well that um, all life can feel pain and all life can suffer, you know. So mm-hmm. therefore, if that's it, if we can minimise that, that's what we're going to do. Right, 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 right. So. That's, 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 that's fascinating. Um, and do you have any animals like, uh, you know, I have so many questions. Do you have any uh, animals like, a, uh, you know, reptiles and amphibians or anything um, like that? Actually, interestingly, okay, so very, very rarely, but about two weeks ago, we had a call um, from somebody in Glasnevin in Dublin saying they'd found a snake. Right? So, wow. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, that's, it is rare, okay, but um, so we hopped into the car and went down anyway, weren't really quite sure what we were going to find and uh, just two members of the public and there was a, a pile of leaves and they could see something moving in the pile of leaves mm-hmm. and this little snake it turned out to be a carolina corn snake they're completely harmless most likely somebody's either dumped or escaped pet so yeah. about two and a half maybe three foot long poor thing was absolutely frozen and was just very very sedate when we picked him up mm-hmm. um put him into the car and literally as soon as in the car he got a little bit livelier as well yes. um so he's gone up to um somebody who's a reptile expert and they're looking we they had him on a rehoming site looking mm-hmm. hopefully somebody was looking for him but i think nobody's actually come forward for him yeah. so he'll be rehomed to somebody who knows what they're doing basically yeah. and to the best home we can have we obviously and can't release him so and and, you know, and this is, does does it often happen like you know you go somewhere and you find like a big python or something like that? No, know? no, very rarely. I think probably the most unusual animal we had in in terms of uh, a non-native species was a giant water rat a couple of years back. Um, that we actually we don't give our, our wildlife casualties names, but we mm-hmm. actually end up calling him Rodney because he was with us for about a year. <laughs> <laughs> That won't become a pet, right? Uh, <laughs> well, Rodney wasn't releasable. Rodney was found down in County Tipperary, um, mm-hmm. I think just on a waterway down there somewhere, and somebody essentially saw... Uh, water rats um, look like a, a bit like a, an Australian wombat, okay? They're mm-hmm. really, really big, and they quite literally are that, a giant rat, okay? So they have mm-hmm. this be- big, long rat tail. They're semi-aquatic, so they have kind of webbed feet, um, mm-hmm. and they're just... They're actually beautiful creatures, so we were all very, very fond of Rodney. Um, they're completely vegetarian, so Rodney mm-hmm. just potted around the place and, um, you know, ate piles of vegetables mm-hmm. every day and was happy out so he actually went to a rescue center in Sligo keep it closer to oh, oh sorry yeah. he went to a rescue center in Sligo in the end and mm-hmm. he's living down there still now as well so right, um, right. we just don't have our facilities again are designed for animals that are transient that are literally coming through rehabilitated and out again yes. Rodney needed somewhere that he was going to be living permanently so yeah yeah. yeah that's Rodney uh, made it onto the 6-1 news and RT by the way so he was a bit <laughs> of a celebrity so. <laughs> of course of <laughs> anyway course. yeah but uh, that's Rodney's story so and, did, and did you see like a like a increase in donation and like through the through the stories like that because you mentioned you know you have a you have your a swan on the on the front page of yeah. the newspaper you you have a yeah. you, you know like your exotic kind of found animal in a, in a tv do you yeah. see like during these times like a spike in interest in people um, coming in? there's a spike in interest there's not necessarily a spike in donations okay so right. you know and right. uh, we would yeah i mean Again, our, our, our work is entirely voluntary, but obviously we do have overheads and we do have costs. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do have as many fundraising initiatives as we have, as we can, sorry. But, um, you know, generally, no, we don't see a spike in donations when we wow. have these. Everyone's fascinated and everyone's interested, um, but people don't. But as, as, you know, as you think when it comes to reaching to your pocket, yeah, and it's like, oh. Yeah, yeah you know, so uh, we do have a, a PayPal account. So if mm-hmm. anyone's interested in donating to any of our work, check out our Facebook page. It's the Kildare mm-hmm. Animal Foundation Wildlife Unit. Yeah. Check it out and just see who we are and what we do. You know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll 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 put the uh, your your uh, donation button on the on the Tommy's Outdoors. Oh, thank you website. very much. Thank you. So, great. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And have you have you guys uh, engaged with the with the likes of uh, Irish Wildlife Foundation and, and these organizations because they're you know. Uh, Seems like we, a natural well, we, kind we of work cooperation. With the, we work with the National Parks and Wildlife Service and that. Yes. So, um, and the Gardaí, again, would contact us if they come mm-hmm. across anything. So any organization we can we can work with, we will work with. So uh, there's an organization called Wild Kildare now that we'd work with as well. And mm-hmm. uh, so pretty much anyone and everyone. Um, there's a hedgehog hospital called the Hogsbrickle over in County Clare. Mm-hmm. Um, they work with us um, quite closely. So 
yeah, like I said, I, we will work as a Kildare Animal Foundation Wildlife Unit. We will work with anyone who'll, who'll yeah. work with us. And so we have a, we're very lucky. We have a good reach out in the community. Um, and as a representative of WRI, of Wildlife Rehabilitation Ireland, um, you know, we work, again, with, with different organisations throughout the, the entire country. Um, we, in WRI, we also run a lot of courses. So we run basic, um, there are two-day wildlife rehabilitation courses. We've had three mm-hmm. this year, I think. The last one was only about a few weeks ago there. Um, and we're hoping to have another three next year as well. Um, we run wildlife conferences again we had one of those about um, I think it was on 27th of October this year mm-hmm. um, out in Slane so we had a number of international speakers coming in for that yeah. um, and then we um, like I said we have four different websites one about wildlife crime dedicated to wildlife crime because unfortunately that can be an issue um, we have one called Irish Wildlife Matters which has all your basic rehab contacts and your wildlife rehabilitation advice um, we have our wildlife hospital um, website which is brand new because mm-hmm. the project's only underway now yes. and then we have our actual home website WRI as well so yes. check them out if you're interested in finding yeah, out more about absolutely. us WRI.ie yeah. yeah. yes exactly, exactly that's, yeah. a, that's the website yeah. you mentioned uh, wildlife crime yeah um, can you can you can you tell us a little bit about the wildlife crime and, yeah. and what's what's your involvement in, in, in um, combat? Thankfully, it's that. quite minimal. Okay, the involvement that we've had, um, but again, we would certainly work with the the guards if they come across anything that, mm-hmm. um, or again, the, the national parks and wildlife rangers if they come across something, they would they would come to us or remember yeah. the public. I suppose it's how you define wildlife crime. People yes. automatically think of kind of an intentional cruelty. Absolutely, that does happen. Thankfully, it's not something we come across a huge amount of. Um, but wildlife crime is everything as well, from like legal hedge cutting, you know, so illegal yes. habitat destruction. So um, if you have, you notice a badger set or you know mm-hmm. there are pigeons nesting in a tree, you know, mm-hmm. you can't take down a tree that has an active yeah. nest in it. So that's actually technically a wildlife crime mm-hmm. because you're interfering with something mm-hmm. that is protected. And all birds in Ireland are pr- protected. Yeah. There are some derogations around, um, you know, say, um, uh, situations, say, in, in agriculture, if birds are going to cause you know damage to a crop etc as well yes um but other than that all birds are protected but then of course you do come across things like you know uh, i suppose the things that we'd find you're asking about you know about being upset mm-hmm. about situations um one of the ones we came across a couple of years back was a badger that had been caught in a snare in cabin Tealy, actually in dublin yes. um he came in with an injury that uh, he had a constriction injury around his stomach yeah. so basically he'd managed to get himself into a snare that had pulled really, really, really tightly and it literally had cut through all his layers of skin right down into his abdomen yeah. um, and he was in a really bad way and we think by the pattern of the ground around where he was found in the snare he probably had been there for several days you know yeah. so that's uh, that's a terrible terrible thing to actually witness and to see yes. we actually did manage to save that badger thankfully and oh, he wow. was released yeah he was released back um, but we have had other badgers in that have been caught in snares that we haven't managed to save and that's, that's upsetting you know when mm-hmm. you see an animal that clearly is suffering and clearly has suffered and there's nothing you can do about it yeah. other than bring their suffering to yeah. an end yeah. you know, so. I think that the uh, Irish Deer Commission is also uh, launched uh, a lot of uh, wildlife crime prevention yeah. initiatives. Yeah. Uh, are you aware of that? Um, it's not something that I'm familiar with um, mm-hmm. personally, but I know there has been a big problem with um, deer poaching, you mm-hmm. know, and part of yep. the problem with deer poaching, again, is people who really don't know what they're doing with the gun, essentially going out, mm-hmm. taking pot shots, and that's exactly the situation I was describing up in Ticknock Woods, you know, where yeah. there are deer out there then that somebody has tried to, to shoot, haven't mm-hmm. done a very good job, and that deer manages to run, and that animal dies yeah. slowly and painfully, yeah. Yeah. you know. Like, I, li- I like this I like this this uh, uh, exp- maybe not expression but like if you're if you see the animal that was that was shot and you know uh, injured and not yeah. killed then somebody was taking a shot that has no business taking absolutely 100% right. you know somebody you go on the range practice with a gun and yeah. make sure that once you once you're taking yeah. a shot you're actually gonna kill an animal because yes. you're out there yeah on the in the woods essentially yeah. you know dealing death yeah so make sure you know what you're doing yeah. 100% you know if you aren't in a position that you can that you can take that animal down instantly and you mm-hmm. can actually and bring his suffering to an end instantly um yeah you're dead right it's a good way of saying it you know you've, you've no right to be taking that shot in the first place yeah, yeah yeah and 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 speaking about that do you have any lot of engagement from the from the hunters and anglers community um we wouldn't have a whole lot of engagement with them um but they certainly we've had people from the deer hunting community speaking at our conferences in the past as well and just mm-hmm. looking from given to explain from their point of view because obviously you know with wildlife rescue and rehab mm-hmm. um hunting isn't something that that a lot of our members would actually agree with but mm-hmm. we also do recognize that there are, you know, 
obviously there are, there are people in the community who would totally disagree with us and that's fine and we do want to hear their voice as well we want to hear that's their, fantastic what doing, that is absolutely fantastic that you're saying that because one of the things that i'm um i actually wrote even blog post about it that all the people who are care about the wildlife mm. and it should work together yeah because it is a hard subject and yeah. the wildlife and the habitat is under so much pressure from yeah. you know from the from the farming sector from the industry from yeah. the uh, mineral extraction from so yeah. on so on that sportsmen uh conservationists people who like to meditate yeah. they actually all should work together they yeah. shouldn't be you know pointing fingers and, and yeah. kind of like oh yeah. over you know you do this and i disagree yeah. with that like well okay fine you know as long as we once we have big healthy habitat a lot of animal there yeah. then we can have that discussion yeah, but at I that point so it's it's yeah. actually a little bit maybe surprising to me but i'm i'm super happy that what you just said like you you know you're actually engaging with this with these people because yeah. i quite and this is the question maybe i'm gonna ask like your what is your perception of like again hunting in an angling community are you think these are like a i actually already said that these are not like because the question i'm asking is like do you think are they bad guys or that are they actually you know like a boots on the ground who see what's happening and quite often like from people who are engaged yeah. in the in a, in a marine marine conservation in irish yeah. wildlife trust they say like well yeah they're boots on the ground they're oh they're there yeah. like every day yeah. they see the animals yeah. they, they have a yeah. lot of information I, I, I think there's there's a point for discussion there you know so um absolutely like i said i I'm not somebody who's going to go out and hunt, okay, so simple, yeah, simple yeah. as that. But I absolutely am saying, I think engagement with people who are involved in various aspects of the community who are, who are doing it responsibly as well, you mm -hmm. know, who are um, absolutely fully aware of what they're doing, know how to, to do it properly. Mm -hmm. um, we, want to, we want to engage with them. We want to talk to them. As you were saying, they're people who know a lot about habitats, know a lot about the environmental issues um, around, you know, around angling, around hunting, around the deer population, okay, and, the, yes. you know, the abundance of the earth we have here. Um, so there are discussions to be had and um, so I guess it might not be something that I personally would engage with or do and I know I think mm -hmm. probably most of my colleagues would be in a similar position mm -hmm. but I think it Obviously. is absolutely important to engage in the dialogue yeah. um, with people who are engaged yeah. you know, and sometimes. even and even you know they they can educate their absolutely. fellow anglers their absolutely. fellow hunters yeah I think it's about creating awareness um, amongst everybody really and especially sense, yeah. wildlife uh, yeah. crime yes that's again yeah. huge yeah. huge aspect because you know like effectively uh, poaching is a wildlife crime and, li and like you and like you said it's it's uh, poaching is not a, so this is you know kind of interesting that poaching is not always like i'm purposely illegally you know going hunt deer at night with the lights or something like that right yeah where there's like poaching is also someone just being unaware yeah. Just, just go, it's, just go. Tommy, it's, and, and it's all about education, you know. Yes. It's all about getting the word out there, and uh, I think that's again where something like social media has a real mm -hmm. power because it creates an understanding. You know, it, it just opens up a whole new world to people and allows them to see animals in a different light that they may not have seen them in before. Yeah, you know, yeah. So. And this is like exactly what I'm trying to do with the podcast: kind yeah. of educate people and have a, you know, people from various walks of life and have them yeah. this and that and something yeah. else because, yeah. like, we have that conversation and someone going to listen to that is like, oh, okay, yeah. I never know yeah. about that. Right. You know, the one thing I will say, I suppose, from um, from my my own pr point of view, having mm -hmm. dealt with all kinds of animals in rehabilitation situations mm -hmm. down through the years now, is that you do really come to realise that every animal doesn't matter, like I said, if it's a pigeon or a fox or a badger or a hare or whatever it is, mm -hmm. every animal is a little individual life, you know, and yes. that life needs to be valued. Simple as that. Yeah. So. You mentioned something about the hares as well yeah. that you're that you're that you're going to come back to it, but I know that. Oh, we'll just when we were talking about um, fawns, you know, people yes. often think that fawns are being abandoned when they haven't. Um, we often come across leverets are baby hares. Mm -hmm. So baby rabbits and baby hares, you see them side by side and you mm -hmm. often really can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. But baby rabbits, when they're born, are completely hairless. Their eyes are closed. They're tiny little kits. They would literally fit in the palm of your hand and they're totally helpless and they're born underground. Okay, so mm -hmm. and they stay underground until they're about two or three weeks old. But baby leverets, when they're born, um, the, the mother hare would give birth and the leverets come out looking like, it looks like something from a Hallmark card. They are like mini versions of an adult hare. They are 
absolutely perfect. Their eyes are open, their ears are open, and literally within a couple of minutes of being born, they're able to run. Okay, so they're just these extraordinary little creatures. Right. So and the they parents, yo, oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so the parents um, don't actually have them in a burrow underground. They actually just leave them in long grass. The parents go off, can again go for an extended period of time. It could be maybe kind of eight to ten hours. Um, they will leave them in long grass. They separate them out. So. You know, if a predator comes along, if they ha- if the mother hare has three leverets, if she leads all three together and a fox comes along or another predator comes along, mm-hmm. she loses all three babies in one go. Yes. So what she does is separate them out. So they mm-hmm. might be up to kind of 10 meters apart. So we'd often get calls from people saying... 10 oh, meters? Is that enough? Yeah. You yeah. don't imagine that the fox will, you know... No, not necessarily. No, oh. no. So and, and they're in very long grass. They're very well hidden, you know. So oh, yeah. um, And so somebody will ring us and say, oh, look, we found an abandoned baby rabbit and we're saying it's probably not a baby rabbit it's a leveret and please leave him where he is and Mm -hmm. it's everything in your instinct is to pick up a baby animal and to look after that baby animal we're saying chances are he's completely fine and just Mm -hmm. needs to be left for his for his mother you know and so we have ended up with with leverets in our care that most likely weren't actually orphaned at all now if someone monitors them and they you know the the parent hasn't come back well then absolutely we'll take them in and we look after Mm -hmm. them but we need to make sure that's definitely the situation yeah Excuse me. Um, so, um, and they're one of those animals as well. When you're talking about success rates, mm-hmm. hares are actually very, very hard to hand rear, you know. So we've about mm-hmm. a 60 to 70 percent success rate with them, um, which is be, wouldn't be that high. Most baby animals you can rear quite successfully. Yes. But um, leverets do really, really well for about two to three weeks. And then when it gets to the point of weaning, they just can't make the transition from formula onto solid food. So that's wow. when you lose uh, maybe not quite half, but up to half. The ones and why is that? Um, their bodies just don't have the... They, they just you're feeding them artificial food or feeding them puppy milk is the ah, closest we can we ah, can okay we so, can so, they, yeah, so they're missing their, some some key yeah, nutrients yeah absolutely now this year actually our success rates have really really risen and the only thing that we've done differently was to add a teeny tiny little bit of live probiotic yogurt into their formula at every single feed and our wow. success rate soared so there you go i'm saying you wow. know nobody has a monopoly on knowledge in wildlife rescue yeah. we've just discovered that this year and did you do you are you doing a lot of like a kind of because it's like a kind of research and development almost it is yeah and and you're doing the, a lot of this this kind of experiments as like well you know i have this animal and it's like you know it's very likely it's not going to survive let's try something new well if you know as long as an animal is doing well we always go tried and tested we always check everything with our vets as well again so we don't just kind of experiment you know and, and say Let, let's try this and see if it's a work we also talk to rehab centers in the uk and they will contact us as well so something mm-hmm. that we've had success with we will share with with our counterparts in the uk and they will share back with us when they have success with something as well but yeah i mean if if an animal is, is, is dying in front of us, we absolutely will try whatever extraordinary measures we can to try and save right. that animal's life if we can. And that may, and then may, if that may learn then. something and that yeah. will benefit the animals yeah, in the yeah, future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that uh, you, you, you know, I'm going to ask you is, 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 that the, is that the true is that the true statement? Is like the, for example, let's take the example of fawns, right? They, they left in, a, in, a, in the long grass and they don't have any smell, right? Yeah. Is, is that correct? You, you, they don't um, kind of propagate any smell and this is one of the one of the uh, mechanism for defense mechanism right i don't know i think you've just taught me something <laughs> oh really so, <laughs> yeah. so 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 this is this is what i heard that yeah. they they compared to the adults they yeah. don't they don't have any smell okay so yeah. so the so the predators are less likely to, oh, yes. to pick them pick, pick, yeah. pick them up yeah so now when the when people are coming in and there's like kind of like, oh you know poor animal mm. whatever they can leave a human smell on them yeah. and that might actually cause the mother to actually abandon them because the mother f- smells um, the smell of a human generally like generally not actually okay? okay so and actually you know people say the same thing about baby birds as well that if you find a baby bird oh as soon as you handle that bird the mother will abandon the nest that's completely untrue okay the, the, yeah the maternal instinct i'm much glad i'm glad i i'm glad yeah. i asked that because we can debunk yeah. that yeah no no the, the maternal instinct is much much stronger so if you find something like um like i said generally it's baby birds because they're small enough for people to handle as yes. well um you know if you find a bird sitting on the ground and you can see the nest in a tree put them right back up there it's completely fine don't worry about handling them and the parents will pay not a, a jot of notice to the fact that you've done that as well okay so wow. yeah it's fine wow. that's, yeah that's good. parents I'm want to protect their babies Mm-hmm. I'm, g- I'm, gl- I'm, g- I'm glad I asked that question. Okay, Edine, so tell us um, how to get involved. And if someone is listening to that podcast and hopefully they say, like, great, you know, I want to get yeah. involved. I want to I help out. Sure. Um, what's, the, what's the 
you know obviously go to wri.ie yeah. help donate is there anything else is like anyone yeah. who wants to go extra mile the extra mile let's say is to um have a look keep an eye out for our wri um rehabilitation courses um like i said we've one hopefully think we have one coming up in january as far as i know january or february I can't mm-hmm. remember the exact dates offhand but mm-hmm. have, have a look on our website anyway and mm-hmm. you can find it there um other than that um have a look at our our facebook page for the kildare animal foundation the wildlife unit um and you know contact us send us a, a private message um anyone is welcome to contact me either if they want to private message me um i'm aideen mcgee it's a-i-d-e-e-n-m-a-g-e-e and i'm on facebook so if anyone wants to contact me um they can private message me on that mm-hmm. um or contact me through the kildare animal foundation wildlife yes. unit either and just or you know look up your local rehabilitator like i said our, our unit is based in kildare i'm based in dublin um but look up um, the Irish Wildlife Matters website and find mm-hmm. who your local rehabilitator is. And is it like in every county? Them. Yeah, there, there are people in most counties, yeah. Oh, you know, okay. Or contact your local vet and just say, listen, do you know any wildlife rehabilitators in your area and get involved that way. So start doing a little bit of research, you know, find out who's there or find out who's in your community. You might have a rehabber very close to you and you just don't realise, you know. So, yes. um, and yeah, get out there and start start doing the do, you know. But do a little bit of research online first yes. and find who's who's closest to you. Yes. Do you have any any concluding thoughts to, for our uh, listeners? Gosh. <laughs> um, just, I think, you know, protect protect the environment, help where you can, simple as that. And, um, you know, if you do come across a wildlife casualty, actually, this is one of the questions that get asked most commonly. If you come across a wildlife casualty, what do you do? And the one thing we say, first of all, is look up Irish Wildlife Matters, find somebody who you can contact. But as soon as you do contact somebody as well, don't touch the animal that you have found unless that animal is in immediate danger. Okay, so mm-hmm. um, and the number one rule is don't put yourself in danger either, by the way. So if you're on a motorway going 120 kilometers an hour and you see an injured animal on the side of the road. Don't slam the brakes. Yeah, you know, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so you're no good if you become a casualty yourself. So help where you can help, um, but be sensible about it. Um, and again, monitor the situation and, and get advice because sometimes animals look like they need help. And in fact, they don't, you know, so um, take photos if you can take photos talk to your your rehabilitator or your vet get the advice if it's an animal that's safe for you to handle and looks like it does need it does need handling get the advice on how to do that and do it safely and please don't try and treat the animal yourself get them to somebody who's experienced and they will do their best to save that animal and to do what they can for that animal as well you know but get involved with wildlife rescue you know <laughs> it's like I said, i've been doing it for about seven years now and mm-hmm. it pretty much has it's it, you know don't expect to take over everyone's life it has taken over my life because it's mm-hmm. a complete utter passion for me um and i can't imagine not doing it my life would be incomplete without it mm. um but it doesn't matter how much or little you can do do what you can to help people will sometimes say to us all i can do is transport you know and we're saying well if we can't get a casualty from a to b we can't do a single thing so no matter how small the thing that you're doing is that is one little cog in a much bigger wheel that actually right. will help to minimize suffering and get that animal back to where it belongs. Awesome. Aideen, okay? I, I think I think you're you're an amazing person. I think you're doing amazing work. Um, one tiny cog in a very big machine, Tommy. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I think you're you're <laughs> quite a big cog in that machine, you know. I think you're quite a big cog in that machine. So listen, uh I wish you all the best in, in, in that work and uh thank you for being on the podcast. It's been fascinating talking to you and I hope that our listener will get a lot of uh uh, insights a lot of knowledge and I hope that uh, also you guys get some uh, be some volunteers or maybe at least yeah. some donations great thank you so much and thanks very much for having me on as well Tommy I really appreciate it very welcome okay thank you bye bye <laughs>